house, and I am so excited to see so many people here at 7 in the morning, even though it feels like 9 to me. So, you know, I'm good. I'm totally good. But we're here, and I want to welcome everyone uh, to the Women of OpenStack Breakfast. This is a working breakfast. We did this in Paris as well. And I want to welcome you all to the place where boats are planes and planes are boats. This is an awesome venue, an awesome place to be, and let's start our adventure uh, all over again as the women of OpenStack, women in open source. We are finding our own way. We are reaching out to other organizations, Python, Apache, Cloud Foundry is reaching out to us. We're trying to find the way that we can find a way forward for women in open source, women in OpenStack, women in cloud. So it's just a very exciting time, and I want us all to just sort of take this moment Look around. We all made it here at 7 in the morning. We're going to make a difference. Let's get going. Um, today, I'm going to talk through the things we've done since Paris, um, as well as give you an outline for how this is going to work this morning. So it's not exactly set up with an aisle in the middle, so we will have to get friendly with each other. Don't climb over tables or anything. Don't go crazy. But we'll get there. We'll get there. But what have we done since Paris? So we had panel discussions in Paris and now in Vancouver as well. There are 19 tech talks by women this afternoon alone. We are doing webinars before even the call for proposals because the OpenStack Summit has a very specific way to do a proposal system, a voting system, and you have to grab attention early, grab attention often. So that is why we did the webinar. Nikki Acosta, Diane Mueller, and myself did a panel that was for everyone. Here's how OpenStack runs their call for proposals. And we also broadened it. If you want to do a call for proposal for any technical conference, here's a great way to do it. We had a communications plan leading up to the summit and uh, have now the o women of OpenStack mailing list. And so you know, one thing I like to emphasize is that it's awesome that we can all come here in person, but there are plenty of women we still want to reach out to and still are reaching out to, and we're giving more and more channels between summits as well. And I do always want to highlight one of my favorite programs. Uh, it was originally the GNOME Outreach Program for Women. It's now called Outreachy. Love that name. Woo! So if you are here today and have gone through the program as an intern, I want you to stand and be recognized. I see you in back. Come on, Victoria. Yeah. And yes, including some of our newest ones. This is so awesome. Thank you for coming. They are doing amazing things even after the internship is completed. Victoria turned around and did a project for Google Summer of Code. That's where you have to find your own project, invent it yourself. Great job. She's also showing a lot of leadership as we need more women to step into mentoring roles and as we need more women to run the outreach program for women to find the interns. She has done an amazing job. Thank you, Victoria. Awesome work. She and Cindy Perales, who's another uh, former intern with OpenStack, were both at Grace Hopper last fall. That is 8,000 women technologists, and it was an amazing conference. So they got to go to dinner together. We all got together again. Um, they um, were basically honored at a dinner for people who came to that uh, event. Then I recently learned, like just last week, that Terry Yu, who's another former intern, just got a Google scholarship. So that's amazing. She's a physicist, did a great job in her internship. And then I also want to recognize how Anita Kuno, who's one of our first interns, has really stepped up and done leadership roles. She actually ran the, one of the elections as an election moderator, and that's a really tough job. So I want to recognize not only that these interns are doing amazing things during their internship, but I love it that you guys are sticking around, making our community stronger. Thank you for that. Now, I also want to talk about we have wonderful mentors. We have mentors who have returned for multiple times. And so while the internship's a tough, intense you know, process, people who are willing to mentor and then step up and mentor again, even though it takes time and you have to really think back to your early days when your eyes were fresh at open source. Um, so I really appreciate that. Um, and then you know, I love that we have the opportunity here to find each other. Um, we have a coffee. Uh, just get together for coffee tomorrow afternoon, right? So find each other, find ways to help each other out in the community. Um, and I love that Cloud Foundry reached out to us to ask to our OpenStack Foundation uh, uh, staff, how do you run your events exactly? There's a lot of logistics that go into just making sure the eggs are hot, making sure the coffee's hot, right? 
That's so important, and the work that they do between summits and for the summits is amazing. So Claire and Allison, thank you so much for all you do. It's wonderful. Okay, and I did not get it on my slide deck, but I want to let you all know at the board meeting on Sunday, the board agreed to put together a diversity working group. That's gonna be a really big part. And even in the board meeting, we said, you know, there's nothing else really like this, but let's innovate, let's figure it out. And so I invite you all to keep, tracks on, keep track on that, see how you can help out, see if people reach out to you, help out with the diversity working group. That's the name of it. Okay. That's it since Paris. Ah, Paris. Let's all have a moment. I love Paris. <laughs> so wonderful. But what are, what are we doing today? So today's goals are to inspire us all. We have three lightning talks, 10 minutes each. Then we're all going to get together and discuss in small groups. And what we want to do is bring back the small groups one takeaway. What do you want to see with the women of OpenStack between now and Tokyo? And then we have a lot of opportunities to share all week and continue the sharing after the summit. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce uh, our speakers today, and then we'll let them, we'll all trade our laptops one at a time. It's going to be awesome. Actually, you guys don't even have slides, right? So we can just leave up my slide. Awesome. Even better. So first of all, uh, sorry, I didn't update the slide. Valerie Aurora is here with Ada Initiative. Um, but is Crystal the one speaking? OK, that's all right. That's good. Crystal Huff is the executive director. Thank you for coming. Um, they are going to talk about beating imposter syndrome. And I have spoken on this before, so I'm really looking forward to how that works. Anything. Um, let me go through all three and then, yeah, sorry. Um, next, we'll have Nina Gorodia. She's a cloud architect with IBM. And so how to be a strong technical leader as a woman what is you know? What are some tips there? And then the third one is Maher Maskaski. She's gonna. She's a co-founder uh, and a VP of product at Platform Nine, and she is a co-founder there. So she's gonna talk about how to be a successful woman entrepreneur. So that's the plan. We're gonna listen to the talks. We're gonna discuss it in small groups. We have we have leaders. Claire, what? Yes. Oh, wonderful. Very good. So at the end of the third talk, we'll um, have people who have volunteered to be sort of like a, a discussion group leader follow whoever you want into the other rooms or stay in here. And that is where we're going to, um, in small groups, talk about what we want to do between now and Tokyo. Then come back. We're going to get this all done before the keynote, I promise. Um, then we're going to come back and share your one idea with the group. Um, just, you know, a little one minute. This is what we talked about. This is what we want to do. That's it. All right. Valerie, you're up. Uh, I'll be down here. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm, uh, as you already know, I'm Valerie Aurora. Uh, so the overall goal of the ADA initiative, just to some slight background, we'll go straight into imposter syndrome, is to support women in open technology and culture. Uh, see, I win. I get the first phone. Uh, <laughs> we, do, we do this through uh, th three main programs. The first one is conference anti-harassment policies. If you notice the OpenStack uh, conference code of conduct, a lot of that is the product of uh, work we've done over the last few years. Uh, our second big event is uh, the Ada Camp on conference for women in open technology and culture. We're having three more this year. I uh, encourage all of you to join. Uh, keep an eye on our Twitter for announcements about that. Uh, our, our next big program is the Ally Skills Workshop. Uh, we believe that men should be doing a proportionate amount of work to improving open source software for women. Uh, and given that men are somewhere around 90, 98%, it's a lot of work. So uh, we teach those at conferences and at companies. And so today I'm here to talk about our final program, which is imposter syndrome training. So first, uh, imposter syndrome is the feeling that you are not qualified to do the job that you already have. Or it, it often includes the feeling that you're a fraud and you're going to be found out any minute now. So somebody's going to notice that you accidentally got this job. right? So I want to ask everyone, if you don't mind playing along, to everyone to raise their hand. Thank you. This signifies nothing except that you are able to raise your hand. OK. So uh, if you think you may have imposter syndrome, leave your hand up. Yes. So this is a lot of incredibly amazing, you can put your hands. It's a lot of incredibly amazing, uh, talented women. And a lot of us feel like perhaps we are not 
uh, qualified for our jobs. So uh, the imposter syndrome is, is uh, especially common in areas where you do a lot of work privately and then you release your finished product publicly and then a whole bunch of people are invited to criticize it madly, right? So this looks like academia, it might sound familiar in open source, um, any kind of thing where you put what your work out there for everyone to see and they get to say mean things on the mailing list about it. Uh, strangely, this produces imposter syndrome. So um, people of all genders have imposter syndrome, but it hits women especially hard in fields that are male stereotyped. So why is that? Uh, the, f the first insight, and this is, I think, a difference in how we talk about imposter syndrome, is that um, you feel like an imposter because people tell you that. They say, you are not a programmer, or when you show up to an event, they ask you why you're here, or if you're a reporter, or something like that, right? Um, so a, a, an important part is that there's a stereotype, it exists, and it causes people to question your ability constantly. Um, and eventually that sinks in. I remember writing kernel code one day and thinking, it's strange that I'm not a kernel programmer, but so-and-so very important person told me I wasn't. Hmm. So it's, a, it's, pretty, it's pretty powerful. Um, the second reason is a stereotype threat, which is an internal form of that same kind of stereotype. That's the fear that you are going to fulfill the negative stereotype of women being unable to program or being too sensitive or whatever it is that um, uh, people are telling you. So, uh, most people, um, well, okay, sorry, there's a third factor, which is that we really discourage women to display self-confidence, to talk about their accomplishments, um, to, it, you know, it's called bragging, right? Or else it's called tooting your own horn. Uh, and so it's really hard to main a, maintain a belief in your competence when you're not allowed to talk about it, and when you do, people punish you, right? So we're saying imposter syndrome is not your fault. <laughs> so the training we've developed for it uh, take, uh, is better than the way that most people cope, for, cope with the imposter syndrome, which is simply working way too hard. Working way too hard, over-preparing, making sure that you know the answer to every possible question is one way to make yourself feel better, but it burns you out, and it costs you, and it, it helps women leave the field earlier, right? So uh, we focus on, in our imposter syndrome training, first we explain where it's coming from, that it's not your fault, and then we go through these uh, simple exercises that you can do whenever imposter syndrome is starting to overcome you uh, or is going to be a th uh, is likely to be a threat. For example, when you're applying for a new job is a really common time for imposter syndrome to hit. Uh, and plus, you get to meet a whole bunch of other really competent women who feel the same way you do. So uh, we teach imposter syndrome at Ada Camp conferences. Uh, we are teaching two public workshops, imposter syndrome training workshops in San Francisco and Sydney. Uh, we will announce those soon. And we're uh, interested in teaching them at companies or universities. You can contact us through any of the email addresses on our website if you're interested in learning more about that. Uh, and yeah, uh, join our mailing list or follow us on social media to learn when we uh, announce new ADA camps and new imposter syndrome training. All right, thank you. Six minutes, yeah. That's lightning, baby. Awesome. <laughs> All right. R I'm going to go back. To the Actually, I might just leave it on the seaplane because I like them. Next up, we have Nina. Here you go. Nice backdrop to talk to. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Valerie. Um, so I'm Nina Garajia, and I'm going to talk on how to grow as a technical leader. And what I decided to focus on is how to make yourself heard literally. Right? This is my third summit. When I look back on the first two summits that I went to, two things stood out. Right? One is the technical sessions I went to, the general technical sessions. Um, very few women presenters. And I know this was discussed at the last summit, so it is a focus area. Um, the number of brown bag sessions we have today is, is, is great. But the other thing that jumped out at me was for the sessions that I attended, very few women actually asked questions at the end, right? Actually, I couldn't remember a single one. So when you think about it, right, at the end of a session, they open up the floor. I didn't see a single woman walk up to the mic and ask a question, right? Now, this is, this is not scientific, right? It's just my personal observation. I'm sure it happened, right? But not in the same proportion as we are attending the summit, right? Um, part of it could be the imposter syndrome, but I think part of it is also um, just, just the way we are, right? How do women, we tend to work, um, we listen, 
let me go off and we work, right? And we're really good at building one-to-one -one relationships. So if you have a question, you will reach out. You will get your question answered, right? If you have ideas, you will reach out to the speaker. You'll reach out to whoever the key person is, and you'll bounce your ideas off that. But it's one-to-one, it's -one, right? But if you want to grow as a technical leader, you have to grow your, your, the scope of your role, right? You have to grow the context in which you're making yourself heard. The one-to-ones don't work enough at that point. Right? Um, so I'm going to start off with um, a slightly embarrassing story about myself, right? And in my defense, this is some time back. I had switched jobs, and um, so I was new to the organization. And it was a really exciting project, and, and I was really looking forward to it. And you know, it's a perfect match for my skill set, so I was really confident about it. I was the only one in the Midwest. I'm from the US. Um, most of the other technical leads were out on the East Coast. Um, that wasn't the issue. The issue was I was new to the team. The others knew each other, right? So we had our first, my first meeting. I call in, obviously it was a conference call. Introduced myself, and they, they were like, hi, and you know, started off, right? And the first guy um, talked, really good, um, really great ideas. I was really happy with the way it was going. Another guy jumped in. He took it in a slightly different direction. I was like, hold on, right? There, there's an issue here. Um, but they were talking really quickly, right? Very confidently, very quick. And I was waiting for a pause where I could say, hey, you know, I, I have this um, issue. He must have like paused to take a breath, I think. Someone else jumps in. And now they're, they're building on it, right? And so then I was like, the next time this other guy took a breath, I said, yes, but he talked right through me, right? And it went on, and I was, and I was, I was trying, and I was trying. And the next thing you know, the moderator's back on. He's like, great discussion. I'll summarize it. I'll send it out in a note. Time's up. I hadn't said a word the whole hour. And I was so frustrated. It was really embarrassing, right? Because you'd let that conversation go in a direction that you completely didn't agree with. I mean, it wasn't a bad thing. But, and I was party to it. Now, at the end of it, you know, I would have to respond to the notes that came out and said, no, but what about this? And I'd have wasted about half an hour of that call. Because the next meeting, we'd have to start back to what I was now having issues with. It was very uncomfortable, and I was so angry with myself. But what do you do? You know, I'm not one of those loud people, right? I, it, it's just not my style. And, and people tell you, you know, here are things you should do, there are things you do, but you have to find something that works for you, right? So what I did at that point is I picked up the phone and I called the guy who was hosting the call, and I said, you know what? I couldn't get a word in, a word in edgewise, right? Next time, can you please pause and say, Nina, right? Give me the mic, right? Just, just give me some air time. And, and so, you know, it took some, and, and we worked out a mechanism. And, it, and I think I also adapted to it, right? Now, I, you know, I don't worry about being polite. I barge right in, right? But it's not something that came to me naturally initially. So looking back on it, I thought, you know, this, this is part of an issue. Sometimes we are, you know, it's not like I'm shy, right? But I think we all have, um, there are times when you do doubt yourself. But even the times when you don't doubt yourself, it's not that easy to get a word in, right? So we have to look at how do we make our presence felt, right? If you have something to say, how can you make it? How can you give yourself the ability to make that statement? Because if you don't, and if you end up working the back channels, you, you don't make your presence felt, right? When there are opportunities, people are not going to think of you. And the thing is, we're in a technical industry, right? This is, at its core, a meritocracy, right? You have to make your presence felt. No one's going to come to you in, in, in an open source movement and say, hey, you know what? You have to talk to Nina because she's an architect in IBM. It doesn't work that way, right? If someone has a question, or if you have to build a reputation, it's based on your abilities. And how do people get to know about your abilities is when you talk. Right? And, and so now if you look at it in the context of the OpenStack movement, right? what does it mean to, to make your presence felt technically? Right? You could go in and you could work on bug fixes, but that's typically not enough. Because as you work on bug fixes, all you're doing is getting review comments from others. Right? Again, it's other people picking your code aside. It's good to do that, you, obviously. right? And it's given that if you're in this field, you're good technically, you want to contribute. But you also have to do code reviews. Right? At the point of doing your code reviews, take the time to explain why. Right? Why did you give a minus one? What are your suggestions? Right? If you're nitpicking, 
right? It's okay to say, you know what, I know this is a net, but here's why I'm giving you a minus one, right? When they fix the code, right, say thank you, right, before you do the plus one, right? Attend the weekly meetings. And again, when you attend it, show up, make your presence felt. At the beginning, say I'm here, right? As the conversations are going, even if you don't have anything to add, if someone says something you, you absolutely agree with, plus one it, right? At the end of it, say good meeting or whatever, and then you'll work your way up, right? You can jump in, right? Log on to the IRC channels, right? People have questions, answer it. That's how you establish your expertise. And people start thinking of you, right? And then you start expanding your role. Obviously, you can you know, do blueprints, but you're making your presence felt in the community. And the nice thing is, as you're working in IRC, I mean, based on the IRC handle, people don't even know whether you're male or female, right? It's absolutely based on what you're contributing, right? So don't let it hold you back. And these are, these are learned skills, right? Adapt to whatever your personality is. But the nice thing in the community is it's a little different, you know, whether you're physically in an office, you're on the phone. And, and that's where you, you kind of practice what works for your style. So when you come to these meetups, it's really the, the, the confluence of the two, right? But you build up your presence in the community, right? And then you expand your role. Because as you grow, right, you always look at, here's my comfort level now, as, as you, know, you spend time. And then how do you expand it, right? So as you establish your presence in, in whatever your subject matter expertise is, right? Volunteer, right? Host a working group, right? Conduct virtual sessions, you know, host a meetup. Um, at, because then as you're expanding, you're growing your skills, you're expanding the, your, your, your sphere of influence, and you're also growing your own leadership skills. And that's how you really end up becoming a go-to person. A lot of my um, growth in my career has actually been tangential, right? You volunteer for things, right? And you go there, and then people get to know your name, right? And then the next thing, something happens, and that's where they, oh, they're like, well, you know what, Nina's there, right? And you're like, how did you even know me, right? But it's just, you live out there, right? I mean, someone's taken a recording, someone's posted something, and the next thing you know, you're out there. And that's really how you grow it. it it's not anyone says, OK, you spent so many here, years here. There's your next promotion. It doesn't work that way. In, in this open source um, environment, right, your background has no meaning. Right? It's what you bring to the table and how you make your presence felt. So just remember, we all have a voice. Make yourself heard. Make your presence felt. All right? Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for having me here. My name is Madhura Miskaski, and um, I'm the co-founder and VP of product in sales at Platform9. And for those of you who don't know Platform9, we have a very interesting way of packaging and deploying OpenStack. You can tell that I've been working in sales for some time. I started right away with a pitch of Platform9 before I, before I could even realize. But, but so today's session is not going to be about Platform9, right? Today's session is not going to be about OpenStack. Um, in this session, I'm going to take just a few minutes to kind of take a walk down the memory lane and uh, share some of my own personal experiences. Um, it's part of my transition from being a technical leader or an engineer to having co-founded something. Right, and then I'm going to start. I'm going to try to share some takeaways from that, just based on some of my learnings. Um, so I came to this country about 13 years or so ago uh, to do my master's in computer science. Uh, I came to Stanford. And when I came here in 2002, um, Stanford was just this completely buzzing place, right? All full of energy. Lots of people, you know, had their goal of finishing their masters and then going off and starting something of their own. Um, and strangely enough, I was never one of those people, right? I never felt that it came naturally to me to be um, to be a co-founder to start something, right? And I think the reason I wanted to say that is because I feel that a lot of women feel that way. And I don't know if it's something about us being women, but we, we assume that a number of jobs, a number of, um, a number of um, leadership positions are just, they don't come naturally to us, right? So I wanted to kind of, kind of stress that. Um, 
Anywho, I, um, I finished my master's at Stanford, and um, I took a job at Oracle. Um, I was part of their core RDBMS team, um, and I really enjoyed it for about a year or so. And so after that, I, um, an opportunity came up to join VMware, um, so I jumped on it. I joined VMware, uh, spent about seven and a half years or so there as a technical leader and architect, and those were some of the, um, you know, some, some very satisfying times of my career. I, uh, I learned a lot. I, uh, I met some really, really talented people. Um, I worked on some really interesting projects. So, um, you know, I think that everything that I learned as part of my career, I learned there. Um, but then came a time around 2011 or so where I started realizing that something is not satisfying, something's not right. Um, I was, um, I was not feeling the adventure, the um, you know, the uh, the adrenaline rush that comes as part of working on something interesting or challenging. Um, and so I figured that this is, you know, I've reached a plateau of my career here, and I need to change something, right? I need to take up a new challenge. Um, so I started, you know, looking. I started interviewing, lined up a few job opportunities, but none of them were satisfying. So I didn't end up accepting any of them. Um, and I was in this kind of slightly frustrated phase when I realized that um, two of my coworkers, who I've worked with for seven and a half years or so, were in the exact same phase. They were going through an exactly similar exercise, um, and that was that was that was good for me to know that because then. From that point onwards, um, we started taking our daily lunch sessions at VMware, um, and we converted them into these kind of detailed um, ideation sessions. So we started, you know, sometimes going outside of VMware to libraries, or sometimes just finding some conference rooms, etc., just so that we could dedicate that hour worth of time uh, towards ideating, right? And and, and when we started, um, the goal was to think of a problem, a problem that interests the three of us, uh, the problem that we think is worth solving, and then just just you know start brainstorming, right? Look at look for um, what type of solution you would build, look for what is there that exists today that solves that problem. Um, it was a very, very fun exercise. We were having so much fun. Um, for me, um, I literally started getting that, that adrenaline rush that I was kind of missing out on. So it was very, very, uh, it was a fun journey. Um, and then one thing we started realizing is that, um, you know, it, it typically happens when you're going through this ideating exercise, all of us have done that, is that when you first think about an idea, you're going through that honeymoon phase, right, where you're really excited about it, you think this is it, um, you know, this is a project worth pursuing for my lifetime. Um, and then you spend about uh, maybe a week or so, um, and then you find out, oh, well, someone else is already doing something that you're talking about. Or, hey, uh, this particular angle, we just never thought about it. We just completely had a brain freeze or something. So, um, so when you go past that honeymoon phase, um, you know, that idea suddenly doesn't, is not as appealing anymore. Um, so what we decided to do then is to apply this kind of the, the meatiness or the weight or you know the gravity of that idea kind of strategy, right? Where, um, if a particular idea stuck with us after um, about two or three months period of time, um, then we're going to pursue it, um, and that's exactly what happened. And um, you know that's when we decided to quit VMware. Uh, we did that in 2013. I quit my job, and uh, my two coworkers, who were my buddies at VMware, um, quit their jobs as well. And so that's how we started Platform 9. Um, so we quit our jobs, and then we opened our office in my coworker Shirish's house. Um, we took over one of his rooms, and we started our office there. Um, and then we started the exercise of fundraising, which is, which is a pretty kind of fun and challenging journey in its own, right? And in most, you know, many times when you talk about fundraising, people give the analogy of dating, um, which uh, in hindsight is just perfect. It's just exactly that, right? Uh, it's, it's literally a game of, um, you know, getting enough interest in you so that you know people really start looking at you. And it's a game of selling yourself to the investors who are in turn selling that idea then to their partners and then ultimately selling that idea to their investors. So it's a pretty, pretty challenging, fun kind of exercise. Um, but in summary, right, um, I wanted to share kind of a couple of takeaways just from this whole exercise that uh, me and my co-founders have gone through. Um, and the first one is, um, you know, if you're 
considering taking you know this step which i 100 percent recommend it's a, an extremely fulfilling satisfying kind of exercise um but if you're considering doing that then i would highly 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 encourage that you find yourself some co-founders right it's um it's just that much more satisfying and fun and amazing um to do it with someone else um it is just not the type of journey that you would want to do on your own um the second one that I would say is um, when you're picking those co-founders, be extremely, extremely, extremely careful about who you're picking, right? Literally think of them as your work spouses because they are. Um, you're going to be spending more time with them than you do with your, your, your real world spouse, right? And, and these are times that are, just, that are not going to be always fun, right? You're, you're going to be going through a number of emotional challenges, um, you know, difficulties, because every company goes through difficult times, as well as good times, literally on a daily basis. So you need to make sure that this person or this group of people are someone you want to go on that journey with. And they're going to stick with you, you know, through difficult times and beautiful times. Um, they're going to have the perseverance. Um, and more importantly, they have the same ideas about that project or the company or where they want to take it that you do. Um, and they have the same work ethic. Right? So it's really, really important. Um, and then lastly, um, equally important, line up as much as possible a series of really, really, really good mentors. Right? We were um, very fortunate when we quit VMware. Um, we were part of this V-Mafia. Uh, that's, th that's the term for all ex-VMware folks who have started companies, um, you know, co-founded something. And it's a very thriving community, and it's a very giving community as well. So we um, were able to find a lot of um, mentors, a lot of advisors. Um, and I cannot describe in words the, the value of that, right? Because um, having someone who has just recently done something that you're trying to do and willing to share those experiences and those learnings, it just can give you that really awesome shortcut where you can just skip past all those mistakes that they did and you know, you know, make sure that you're taking the path that's more efficient. So definitely do that. And it doesn't matter whether you belong to a particular community that makes it easy to you know, get such mentors, et cetera. What I have realized about Silicon Valley is that people are, or, or just you know, the tech industry in general, it doesn't have to be Silicon Valley. Um, people are extremely, extremely friendly and helpful. Um, and all it takes is for you to reach out to them and ask for help. Because um, that's exactly what we did. We um, spotted people that we would have really liked to have as mentors. And then we went and attended sessions and talks that they were presenting. And then we stayed around afterwards and caught hold of them, and then requested for meetings and re requested for sessions. And then we struck a chord, um, and we found a common ground. And that's how we got a bunch of mentors we got today. And there is just an immense amount of value um, towards lining up you know, these mentors. So that's just, in a nutshell, what I wanted to share. I hope that was um, helpful, interesting. And again, thank you for having me here. Thank you very much. She was right on time. I don't know if you heard. So very inspiring talks. And so I want, thank you so much for waking up early and spending the last hour with us. And I promise we will keep you on time. But we want to spend the next 30 minutes in small groups. I want you to take what these women said as inspiration. Because what we want to do as a group is to figure out what we are going to achieve before the next summit in Tokyo. So as Anne started the presentation, we were able to do a couple, just a couple of things between Paris um, and Vancouver that I had, think had a big impact. And so we don't want to try to do 15 things, but we want to try to do one thing. So that's the next part of the exercise. So in 30 minutes, for the next 30 minutes, we're going to break up into small groups. Um, there are some, if the group leaders could join me up here in the front of the room. We're going to break up into smaller groups. We have room here and also in 115 and 116 across the way. We're going to spend the first 15 minutes just, you know, exp you know, talking as a group. You know, what did you hear today? How did that inspire you? And the last 15 minutes, we're going to come up, each group is going to come up with one thing that they want to try to achieve before next summit. And then they will have a single person will come up and do a one minute talk on what the idea is. So that's what we're going to do for the next 30 minutes. So if the leaders could come up here. The, yes, and let's give another hand for our presenters, please. Thank you. <laughs> the 
did an excellent job. All right. Okay, we're going to do this old school style. So I want people to um, come up here, ladies. Number yourself off one through seven, and then we'll start again. One. Three. Three. Then let's go back here. Seven. Oh, seven on the wall. Yes, yeah, seven. Yeah. One. 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 Five. Two. Two. <laughs> Any more back there? Do we need any more back here? I did not notice. That, that probably does have some statistical significance. So we'll, we'll have to take special note of what group three comes back with. Four, six, one, three. Did you get a number? Did everyone get a number? OK, so our leaders come up here. I'm going to take group one. So who is group one? We're going to meet in here in the front of the room. You're going to have group two. So hold up the two. Two. And where would you like to meet? Um, there, maybe. Right here in the front yeah. of the room. OK. <laughs> Joanna will have group three. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're looking forward to what you guys come back with. <laughs> Nina has group four. Where would you like to meet in the? Okay, we do have two rooms across the hall. So you're going to go across the hall. Your group four. Okay, group four. You're going to be group five. Okay, group six is with Maria Rita, and where's our other speaker? Oh, she's in the back. Group seven. Uh, can you come in? <laughs> the, the other speaker, yes. Valerie? Yes, you are. <laughs> so Valerie is group seven, and she's going to be across the room as well. Across, across the way, okay. All right, everyone break. We'll come back in 30 minutes. I can't wait to hear your ideas.
here we go. Introduce uh, yourself. Yeah, hi everyone. I'm Madhuri. I work in NEC. So uh, I'm a co-reviewer in the project uh, OpenStack Containers that it that is Magnum. So uh, like uh, my idea to contribute uh, to uh, bring up more women in OpenStack is to give give travel support to women. Like I have been, uh, this is my first OpenStack submit and I'm able to attend this just because of the travel support program. If I have not got this uh, opportunity, I, w I really would have not been here. Like uh, uh, my like my next motive is to become a PTL of an OpenStack project. And I know that's a big aim to achieve, but uh, this travel support is really going to help me as because I'll be attending the design discussions uh, of the project. So that will really help me. So I think uh, increasing the travel support program for women especially, it will really help the women. Thank, right. Thank you. Group two. Hello, uh, my name is Courtney Ferry. I am a solutions engineer at Carpathia Hosting, um, which means I architect clouds. So uh, our group uh, has identified that we don't think there are enough women involved um, in technology and in, the, in, in the OpenStack community. And one of the things that we see is that when people come in or when women come in, lots of times they get involved briefly and then they kind of fall out. They kind of get lost. And we think a lot of that, um, and we'd like to see sessions and maybe bring in ideas on how to get peop women to come in and get them to stay in. And we think uh, part of the solution to that is mentorship and sponsorship. Uh, mentorship to help bring them in get them involved, get them comfortable, give them leadership and sponsorship to help them get into the further leadership roles, taking them into the things like becoming PTLs. Um, and so we'd like to have people in those higher end leadership roles, giving talks and lectures on how to take that path. Thank you, Courtney. Very good. Round of applause. Very good. Group three. Good morning, I'm Margaret Kiyosi. I work for at and I don't know if you're familiar with the Domain 2.0. This is where we're uh, virtualizing our whole network on SDN and virtualization. So I'm actually the front door for all our projects. I'm also president of OPNFE, which we initiate on the networking side. So my group um, spent a lot of time discussing how do we become more effective in meetings? How do we interrupt the meetings? And so the suggestion was to create a webinar. My understanding is uh, the um, OpenStack Foundation has money. Lots of money. I've seen the I've seen the budget. I've seen the budget too. So, and so to create a webinar uh, to basically do a role playing on meetings, how not to do it. So basically, I assume it's going to be a bunch of men talking, a bunch of women there. Women not saying anything, can't get a word in edgewise. The women try to interrupt, and the guys walk talk over them. And then how to do it more effectively on the other side. Um, and one of the other suggestions is maybe from the webinar is to have at the next uh, Tokyo summit. If each woman would ask at least one or two questions in any of your you know, sessions you go to as a target. And because in the end, the view is the more you practice, the easier it'll get. Um, go from there. OK, thank you. Thank you so much. Round of applause. Yes. Group four. Group four. Hi, my name is Amanda. I'm with SwiftStack. I'm a mini hatter there. It's a startup, so I get to do a little bit of everything. We have a deployment management over Swift, basically. Our group four talked. We had a lot of good conversation, including talking about the fact that there's only, I think it was 9% women right now at the conference. That number has actually doubled, so it's been getting bigger, which is good, but we wanted to see a higher inclusion and awareness, especially within the mainstream of the community. We were talking about doing that in a number of ways, including next session or next in Tokyo, having maybe some developing soft skills and leadership, that sort of thing, doing a series, at least a couple of workshops in that, of that nature. It would be open to everyone. And it would also include the messaging of being sensitive about culture and gender and all of these other things and sort of incorporating it so that it's helping everybody, including ourselves. Also things like the communication gap, especially for regions. What's happening, you know, if a great session or uh, conference happens over in India, the word should be spreading everywhere through the OpenStack Foundation, not just locally within one region, that sort of thing. And we also thought that um, having something that focuses a little more on the success of women, you know, have a 
part of when the news goes out about what's happening in the OpenStack world, make sure there's a bullet point that's talking about what's happening with uh, one woman, one woman group, what have you, just making it uh, more incorporated. Hi, I'm Emily Hogenbrook from IBM, and I work on the Tempest project. And so our group talked about ways that we could think of to try to get a keynote speaker who's a woman. Uh, so this is a focus area for the foundation. So we talked about uh, pipeline, maybe different speaking opportunities at meetups um, or over the internet uh, ahead of the summit. Also possibly doing a panel discussion because sometimes women feel more comfortable if they're being asked questions rather than just getting up there and, and being a keynote speaker. So we talked about that. We also talked about perhaps doing some um, user stories or um, app developer stories for the, the keynote, uh, branch out in a, a different direction. And then we also talked about the idea of at the summits doing um, maybe some speaker training or doing some assertiveness training and um, maybe even helping people with uh, disorders like uh, Asperger's syndrome and things like that, how they can be more assertive and, and be more part of discussions. And we actually have somebody who probably could do a keynote, Jane. <laughs> Jane from Canonical is here today, so thanks for joining us. All right, next. Last time I held one of these, I was five years old and I scared myself silly. Um, <laughs> um, I'm Susie Gray. I'm actually from IBM. No, I'm not. <laughs> I did. <laughs> we, did a, we had someone in our group did that. I'm from HP. <laughs> Nerves. Um. <laughs> no. No, I, 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 I used to work for IBM, so. Yeah. I got that last night going around the booze. Oh, we're looking for people. <laughs> I love my job. I, HP has been fantastic and enough running up HP. I actually work on, I work on Goza, which is basically the systems that do with the automated um, development and testing for the guys that are developing the cloud products. Um, and I work downstream in the HP version of that, but we also submit code upstream. So I'm a DevOps person. Um, I'm also a teacher. Um, and I'm used to standing up in front of high school students, so it's not quite too bad. Um, okay, so what we came up with was a combination of things which is along the same lines of a lot of people are saying um, that we need more mentoring and that sort of thing. Someone came up with the idea, it was a brilliant idea of actually setting up a private IRC channel. Um, now, even the non-technical people, we can actually give you instructions on how to do it. It's fairly easy to use, fairly easy to set up. Because it's a group thing, if we had a private channel for women so that they feel they've got that safe space, they can ask questions and discuss, this way you get to know people and everyone's talking about stuff and everyone can support everyone else to a degree because people are busy. But if you gel with one person, then you can actually find that mentor that way rather than being assigned a mentor that may or may not be the right person for you. Um, and so we thought this might be a really good idea to actually um, develop that whole mentor system and do some more mentoring. And we want to do it, even if you guys don't vote for this, we're, we're planning on approaching the foundation and actually setting it up. <laughs> That's a great idea. Group seven. Yeah. We're, we're the Bopsy twins. Uh, <laughs> so I'm Beth Cohen, and I work for Verizon. And I'm not actually currently doing anything with OpenStack, and I am willing to admit that. <laughs> uh, but uh, so my idea is, and our group in general, was uh, to do a um, really create a f um, platform for informal mentoring. Uh, so there's a lot of formal programs, and I know a lot of companies have formal programs, and and OpenStack doesn't really. But um, so I think it's really important for people to understand that mentoring can be a 15-minute conversation. It can be your Rolodex. I know that's an old-fashioned word, um, but that those people that you meet and you spend time with, they're your future employers and they're the people that you're going to be working with over your career. So it's really important to develop that 
uh, that informal networking. And so I'm proposing that we use the mechanisms. The IRC chat is great for that, and also the women of OpenStack LinkedIn um, uh, um, LinkedIn group now and other groups that I think we need to really get that going. So, and I will turn it over to Valerie. Sure. Very briefly, the other two things we talked about were uh, whether we were interested in solutions that changed w changed women or solutions that changed the structures that uh, create sexism, and we agreed we we're interested in changing the structures. Uh, some concrete things related to the mentor mentorship are um, uh, adopt going to our managers and pushing to have mentorship recognized as something that gets you uh, promoted. So it's an official formal part of the performance review, which is the case in some companies already. Uh, and the second one was uh, some to talk, work on ideas for making the OpenStack Karma Point system re uh, both valuable to your promotion in your, in your company, and also that Karma Point should be given for mentoring-like activities. So it's a good group. Great. All right. Thank you, guys. Okay, so we, we, I want to keep us on time. Thank you so much for coming. I was telling my group earlier, from I am so humbled. We had 30 people in the room in Paris, and I know it was Paris, and people were partying the night before, and it was late. <laughs> But I was just overwhelmed when I saw this group. There was about 90 people at our peak, and I really do appreciate you guys. Hands, I mean, a, really a hand of applause for you guys getting up and coming. We really do appreciate it. So we want Claire and the OpenStack Foundation. I want to thank them as, again, and then hopefully we'll have a room for 200 when we're in Tokyo. That would be the goal. And we'll hopefully we'll fill every seat. So thank you again. I will be sending out minutes of the meeting to the Women of OpenStack mailing list. If you're not uh, a part of that, please uh, get with me afterwards. I can give you instructions on how to sign up. And uh, look for the IRC channel that's going to be starting out. That's a great idea. And please, on the way out, um, so Intel and IBM have provided some yoga mats and umbrellas. Please take them on the way out. And did you have something to say? Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys. Have a great conference. Thank you. Thank you.